Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Training Tidbits podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge from Animal Training Academy, and as always, it's wonderful to have you here with us today. And I can't wait to talk all about best practice animal training and behavior management with today's guest. Just before we do get started, though, I want to say a massive thank you to everyone that listens to this podcast on a regular basis, and stay sure, anyone who might be joining us for the first time ever. The show is so much fun to make, and we've just passed a quarter century mark with our episodes and over 12,000 downloads. My goal for 2017 is for the information in this show to be spread as far and as wide as possible. And in this mission, I would like to ask for your help. So please share this episode with your friends, family and colleagues on social media, via email or however you can. And I discovered something brand new this week, which makes this super, super easy for you to do. I know a lot of you listen to the podcast on your mobile devices and smartphones, and you have access to it through the podcast app on these devices. So something I discovered was that at the bottom left-hand corner of most of the apps, it might be somewhere different depending on what app you're using, but there's three little dots, and if you tap them, it opens up a menu. One option in that menu is to share. If you click that, you can really easily share it on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, or whatever other social media network you might be using. I would be forever in your debt and grateful if you could take a couple of seconds to do that. But moving on to today's guest, someone whom I'm absolutely pumped to have on the show, someone who has really inspired me over the last couple of years one Mr. Valda Stellard. Valda has been in the animal field for 26 years. His passion and career began in the Netherlands while working in a wildlife rehabilitation centre. He created his own animal ambulance while finishing his animal care studies. In search for further education, he came to the US where he graduated from the Exotic Animal Training and Management Program at Moore Park College. After an internship, he was hired at Natural Encounters Incorporated. He helped create, set up, train and present bird shows at zoos and aquariums across the country. As a director of behavioral programs, he consulted both nationally and internationally to create zoo-wide animal training programs with keepers to grow their training and presentation skills. Currently, Vada is the animal programs training director at the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium. He is responsible for the training of staff and animals in a variety of areas with a variety of taxa. He and his team produce natural behavior, mixed species shows, run an immersive Close Encounters guest area, as well as an African exhibit experience. The African exhibit focuses on life around an African watering hole, featuring cheetah runs, bird flights, hoof stock, and a variety of mammal talks. Vouda's passion is to teach people how to train animals using the science of behavior change and further the industry standards. So without further ado, I am extremely excited to say the least to introduce one Vada Stella to the show today. Hello, Vada. Ryan, how are you, man? I am fantastic. How's everything over there in Columbus? Everything in Columbus is going fantastic. We have a great team and working on so many projects. So I like being busy and that we definitely are up here. Awesome. Hey, it's an absolute honor to have you on the show today, Vada. Let's Let's dive straight into the first question. I was wondering if you could please take us back to where you first learned about positive reinforcement animal training and some of the first animals you ever trained using it. Man, that's a that's a great question, but there's so many out there, you know. Your best teachers are usually the animals you start with, and I've had some great teachers. Moore Park College was an amazing college to go to. I had great teachers like Gary Wilson, who is still out there teaching everybody how to use positive reinforcement to train animals, and he helped us train a sea lion out there, was training a sea lion, with, who she taught me a lot of stuff and um you know steve was one of the steve martin was one of the guys that really got me thinking about how to make training part of the animal's choice so we stopped talking about ask or making an animal do something and he always asked the animal to participate in training and so he was the first one to introduce me to susan friedman who of course put all the science behind everything i always wanted to know and she's still a, a great mentor so you know first animals is probably let sea lion at Moore Park College that I've learned a lot from. But then the hundreds of birds that Steve had were amazing teachers and lots of people out there as well. And we've had a couple of guests talk about Moore Park College on the show. Uh-huh. And yeah. it sounds like such an inspirational place to start to learn about this stuff. And you were working with a RC line there. Can you share any stories uh-huh. from your time with... Oh, man, there is there is so many stories with that sea line. And first of all, let's start with Moore Park College. It is an inspirational place. I 
came out of Holland and I barely, I spoke some English, but not a ton. And when I got to Moor Park, it's basically a zoo. It's like, who doesn't want to go to school at a zoo? And so we would come in at six o'clock in the morning and take care of the animals. So you build a relationship with the animals and you come in and before your eight o'clock class, you better make sure all the areas are cleaned. And it depends. Every different week was a different area. And then when I went through there, which is way back when, we had to do a night watch. So we, once a week, a team of us would stay there and do rounds at night and take care of, make sure that the animals were safe and secure and nothing was out of the ordinary. So it was an amazing experience for me to learn from so many great teachers out there. Like we said, Gary and Cindy and God, Bill Walden was out there when I was out there. And those are lots of people out there that have influenced so many people. And I never thought I would like it. And I embraced it and loved it and think about it many times. And so the sea lion, man, from day one when I was there, because I was an international student, what am I going to do in northern LA then hang out with animals? That sounds pretty cool. So I made sure I was there a lot. I spent a lot of time at that zoo and I ended up going to see a lot of the sea lion sessions and pretty soon I was helping them doing fish and showing interest and that sea lion had so many behaviors on her. The department I work for right now is Jack Hanna's department basically so with some of the stuff we do is with Jack Hanna the animal guy out of the US and the first time I met Jack was with the sea lion. We were doing a spot in LA at Larry King Live when he was still on the air and we were asked to bring the sea lion out so the four trainers including me went out there and brought on the set and it never really worked out but I have this really funky picture of me with hair and Jack looking exactly the same and I remember that sea lion we put so much fish in her during the session and trying to get her on TV but it never worked to where we were in the garage downstairs and that sea lion wasn't going anywhere for fish was spitting out fish and we had to try to figure out how do we get her in the crate how do we get her back into her enclosure that's in the back of the pickup truck at that point and I remember that some of the favorite trainers would crawl into the truck on the outside of the crate and just kind of call her over and she finally decided to go in but that was not after we had a bunch of cars drive by and it was those guys were probably wondering what are you guys doing down here trying to have a sea lion at Lon Larry King but that was probably one of my favorite stories of Shmoo the sea lion. Hey just a quick question just before we move on to yeah. talking about your current role the uh -huh. last two more part graduates we've had on this show have both been American and uh -huh. so now we have you who came from the Netherlands and, and went to Moore Park. Is that the reason you came to the States? And Absolutely. Was, and can you run us through, just for other people listening out there who might be interested in an opportunity like this, how did you go about back then? I know it wasn't last year or anything like that, but how did you go about applying for Moore Park? That was totally by chance. In Holland, I wanted to do something in a zoo. And when I graduated in Holland, I had a degree and I could go into any zoo in Holland. But you know, 50 students graduate every year from this program. And there's 11 great zoos back then, there was 11 great zoos in Holland. And so there was a pretty small chance that you would make it into the zoo industry there. And I was wanting to learn more. And prior, when I was 18, 17, 18 years old, I went to the United States as a exchange student. For three weeks, it was a rotary exchange. And so I went to an American family and they hosted me. And then the next year, their son would come to us and we hosted him. So he got the Dutch experience. We got the American experience with the hamburgers and the French fries. And the, I remember getting Cokes that I just kept filling up and up and up and up. It was really an experience, but I stayed in touch with that family. And so as soon as I graduated, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I applied at some zoos and stuff. And then they said, hey, there's a school in LA that does exotic animal training. Why don't you check it out? And I'm like, aha, that's funny. I went online, printed out the little form, filled it out, put a stamp on it and never thought back of it. You know, I never thought back of like, oh yeah, I remember doing that thing. Well, July 15th rolls around and to my biggest fear, here's a letter in the mail says, okay, you guys start August 7th. See you here. You're at, you're accepted. And that was a shock to the system. That was like, okay, stop everything you used to and go to a completely different world, completely different different to where you need to get a car, you need to get housing, you need to get books. You know, in Holland, when you go to the Moore Park, to the Eden program, your first day you sit down, all your books are there, your schedule's there. Now you have to sign up for classes. You have to go get your books at the bookstore. What is all this? So it was a huge culture shock, but it was amazing. I had a lot of help from uh, Duncan and Nancy there, that host family that I had in Santa Rosa, California. They helped me out a ton, just making sure I settled in. And my dad was one of the ones that basically gave me peace of mind that said, if you stay in that program for a year, I'll help you out, but it'll be good for you to be in a different country for a while because it definitely for me was a, 
a challenge not to run home and go, you know what, I was comfortable here. I'm good. So they helped out. And, you know, Moore Park became your family, just like probably Chris and Annika talked about. They are family. Like when you say to two people that talk to me, I probably pretty much know who those people are because we know what class they graduated from. And some of my friends and first questions always, oh, you're from Moore Park. What class? What year? When did you graduate? So it's family. It's a great place to go. And I think it got me started. I always say they give you a lot of skills and they, they make you good trainers. And then you go out into the industry and then they'll the industry will make you wonderful trainers. So there's actually three people that have been to Moore Park. You're the fourth. The other one's Debbie Marin. Oh, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. It must have been a big turning point in your life because you remember the exact date. Oh, yeah. It, 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 and, was, it was huge. And the thing that really stuck out to me in your story there, from what I know from the time we've spent together, is just your passion to learn more pushed you kind of towards that. Oh, yeah. You know, there's almost always so much more to learn, and I don't think we're ever done learning. And I think as long as we can keep that open mind and keep pushing towards learning from others and you know, collecting the data, you know me so well, I always talking about show me the data. I want that data. Show me, you might tell me I can train something different in a better way. Cool. Let's look at the data. Let's look at what that looks like on paper. Let's look at the data. And then we'll, we'll, we can both look at it and decide if that data goes my way or your way. And usually it goes our way. We both have the right direction to go. We're going to be talking about collecting the data later. And if you take one vouterism away from the show today, then that's going to be it. Hey, <laughs> I absolutely love learning about people's behavioral odysseys as I like to call them. Vada, could you now please bring us up to date and tell us a little bit more about your current role, especially this really innovative African experience that I briefly mentioned in your bio? Oh man, my current role, it's got a long title, but that's Animal Programs Training Director. And it really is a managerial position for me because as you know, I'm really passionate about teaching people to learn about animal training and how to help animals along in their day-to-day -day lives. And so in this position, Susie Rapp, my current boss, helps me out a ton and allows me to do a lot of teaching. We have the Animal Encounters Village, which is a great area. It's one of my passion areas. We have a director that used to say, touch the heart to teach the mind. You got to touch them somehow to connect them with wildlife. And what we do there is during the winter, Winter, we do outreach programs. So we take all these animals to schools and teach kids about um, these animals. And then when you talk to the summers, when the schools are out, we have this little village area where we bring these animals out and every person that walks through there has an opportunity to touch a bearded dragon or a ball python and have an experience with it. We do penguin swims, we do sloth encounters, we do all these behavior driven shows to where people will get passionate about animals again. Because I think that, you know, when you talk to some people, I just saw Mark Simmons talk at ABMA, and he talked about nature deficit disorder. I think it's one thing that we are seeing nowadays is that we're getting further and further away from wildlife. And that is going to be what we're looking at. We need to push into get these animals back, get people smelling them and touching them and seeing how amazing they behave to get them caring about it again. And I think that's a big part of that Animal Encounters Village area that we're part of. We have the promotions department where we do a lot of things for Jack Hanna. And we help Jack Hanna with his TV shows. We go to Good Morning America. He does theater shows. He does all these speeches. So our department travels from one speech to the next to the next. While Jack flies, imagine two vans driving across the country trying to get animals to the spots where he does his speeches. And then the Africa building is a great example of one of the newer exhibits. It's called the watering hole. And imagine a watering hole just like we have in Africa. You sit there in your Land Rover and, you know, you never know what happens. And we don't tell our audience we tell our guests because it's open the whole day we don't tell our guests what are, what is in there there could be warthogs in there in the morning and then all of a sudden at 10 o'clock somebody walks out gives the warthogs a little bit of a talk and gives them a couple treats and shows people how they run with their tails up and as soon as they run a cheetah comes out and a cheetah starts running around and we talk about the predators and the cheetah just finished the run and we talk about how fast they are and we might send out another cheetah and talk about all the cool adaptations the cheetah has and as soon as that cheetah is secure a bunch of jackals go running around and they start eating their different reinforcers that are laid around, tactfully laid around, and they're super active out there. And as soon as they're done, we might leave them out there for an hour or two. As soon as they're done, here comes another person on a microphone and we have an aardvark that has learned to heal with us. We actually have two of them. And so we do an aardvark talk. And during the aardvark talk, a hornbill will fly over. So 
all these people are immersed and they're also feeling that little bit that we don't really are used to is this, you know what, you might not see the animal. We're so used to going, okay, where's the hyena? Oh, go to the hyena exhibit. But the watering hole has hyenas, but you might come here four times and never see the hyenas. It's the difficulty is to teach the people that it's ever changing. And that's a very healthy thing for not only the audience to learn, but it's also a healthy thing for the animals that they don't know what their schedule looks like in a day-to-day -day basis. So great animals, it's a great exhibit. And you know, I couldn't do it without a great staff so all those areas have a wonderful staff and maybe that's the last thing I, I really love about my job is that that animal encounters village runs on three full-time people two part-time people and 24 to 28 seasonals and so those seasonals come right out of school it's almost like a little more park college and we teach them how to do show presentation and i do my animal training workshops and i help them out that way and help them grow so you can see i don't like my job at all so basically, a visitor to Columbus Zoo could go to the African watering hole exhibit and sit there all day and be consistently entertained and obviously educated. Yeah, exactly. They have an opportunity to see different things. And we're on microphone a lot out there. We're educating, trying to teach them a lot of things that are going on, not only in the watering hole, but also in the savannah behind there. There are animals, our giraffe and all that stuff is out there. So not only can we educate them about the stuff that's close, but also the stuff that's far away. And one of the things that Susie really wanted in this exhibit is to have a cheetah run that we do three times a day. The cheetah run is really cool, but it's not the area that the cheetahs will live in. It's not the cheetah exhibit. So the area is still very active. And we also have a cheetah exhibit where people all day long can see the cheetahs. So we're very heavy in cheetahs. We use the cheetahs a lot. We take them on programs. So we help CCF, the Cheetah Conservation Fund, with all their programs. When they have a fundraiser in Washington, we will actually bring a cheetah and help them raise money. Uh, we had a cheetah conservation day here this year that Hardy Kern was a big part of. He put it all together and made sure people learned about cheetahs. And so there's a heavy conservation element to what we do, but we want to make sure that we carry a entertainment value through there as well. Some cool takeaways from there. Touch the heart to teach the mind and the nature deficit disorder. Hey, just quickly, I want to go on to the next question, but just for those people who are listening and maybe aren't familiar with Jack Hanna, you've mentioned him a couple of times. Can you just give a really quick rundown of, of who Jack Hanna is and his history with the Columbus Zoo? Man, there is, there. I don't think there's a way to describe Jack <laughs> Hanna's legacy really briefly. Jack is just such an amazing person, so passionate about wildlife, so passionate about what we do. And, and so he wants to bring the animals to the people. When he started at the Columbus Zoo 30 some years ago, the zoo wasn't very highly rated. It was one of the lowest rated zoos in the United States. And he decided that if he was going to be director there, then if people didn't want to come to the zoo, he will take the animals to the people. So he started going out and showing people how cool these animals are. And he started slowly doing more and more. And then he does his TV program into the wild. So people know him here. He's very well known. He's on Good Morning America. He does all those programs and he travels and he does these theater shows like we talked about a little bit earlier. So Jack has a huge impact on the Columbus Zoo. There's a lot of people that will come to the zoo just to see if Jack is there. And he's a huge part of what we do. And his passion just carries across the Columbus Zoo. Hey, thanks for that, Vada. And really inspiring. I just love the innovation with that African watering hole. I can't wait to get my butt to Columbus Zoo and check it out with my own eyes. Hey, recently, Valda, I had the pleasure of attending some talks that you presented at the Australasian Society of Zookeeping Conference in Adelaide, Australia in April 2016. There were so many things that you covered that really opened my eyes and made me look at things in new ways. Moving forward, I wanted to cover a couple of these. And the first one is something that you just mentioned, and I think a large majority of the listeners of this podcast will be able to relate to and I know I definitely can and this is the importance of team when managing animal behavior not only for your zoo teams but for anyone managing animal behavior when there's more than one person involved for example in our households with our pets Vada can you talk to us about the importance of teamwork when managing animal behavior man that is such a huge subject isn't it I think we are so want to be the best animal trainer in the world and I don't think there is one animal trainer that's the best I think there's a lot of teams out there and I think there's a lot of teams because for me to be able to come share 
the information with you guys in Adelaide, which was a blast, by the way, was great. But I could only do that because I had a great team back in Columbus to take care of all these other things. So I think for me, team is all about communication. It's all about sharing the knowledge. It's all about making sure that you have the most honest communication. And that means it's the most difficult thing is to tell somebody, okay, you didn't do this right, or you didn't do that right. There's ways that you can do that in a very supportive way, but you got to be in a supportive environment. And so when you come in and you come in as I know it all, and I've done it, I've been there myself to where I would walk in and I've seen a training session, I've been gone for a week, and I go, Oh, hey, I know the answer to this and, and just completely undermine all the people that work their butts off while I was gone in Australia. And now I act like I know what I'm doing and know what they did wrong while I wasn't there completely wrong. And the cool thing about my staff is go, Hey, hold on, buddy, time out, honest communication, right? We've worked on this while you were gone. Why don't you take a couple sessions and come see what we're doing. And then we'll start talking about how we all see it. I think it's very sensitive to have a team that is happy to share their information, but also happy to let you know that, hold on, you're stepping out of line a little bit, or let's have this honest communication. So for me, it's about truthful feedback. For me, it's about making sure that people understand where we all stand. And, you know, without the team I have, I couldn't do any of the stuff I love to do. Communication, sharing the knowledge, honesty, supportive environment, truthful feedback, and so important. If that stuff's not going on, we can make a prediction that the messages we're giving our animals might not be as clear as we would ideally hope. And that's obviously going to influence the behavioral programs we have in place. Absolutely. I think that a big part of it is that communication, because if we're work at the animals and I'm working it and I need to keep going on the weekend and I need to communicate it to you what's going on, then I need to have clear communication to you. Say, hey, Ryan, you know what? I'm trying to do this blood draw. This is the spot I'm at. Here's the approximation I'm at. This is the steps I've taken. And can you carry it from here on? And then on your Monday, let me know what you did and carry that on. Because otherwise it becomes that telephone game. You know, you tell somebody something and then that person tells somebody something else. And pretty soon from going from take two steps to the right, your jump four, four feet in the air. And we nobody knows where it went south. You got to have that open communication and you got to make sure that everybody understands where we stand. And it comes with education, comes with making sure everybody understands, you know, when we talk about not labeling animals, why we don't label animals, you know, what point we reinforce, what marker we use or what bridging stimulus we're using, if we're using one at all. And, you know, I think that communication is all about education and it's about making sure that your team speaks the same language i guess that's the, the way i look at it so once again because i really like these let's call them five key components of a successful team communication which you just talked about in depth there sharing the knowledge honesty supportive environment truthful feedback one might say that this is something that would form what we might label as a functional team just before we move on to the next question can you potentially think of one takeaway message for those listening to this podcast about a step they could take towards making their teams more functional i i think that's a that's a great question and i think when you look like you just described i think that is the ideal picture of a very well functioning team. Almost, if you can say too well functioning, I think every team has its drawbacks. I think every team is always a work in progress. As functional as you might think your team is, or as dysfunctional as you might think your team is, every step towards better communication, better appreciation of each other is a step forward. So, so when you talk about these teams as functional teams, I think you're looking at a, a high goal. All these steps, all these communication, all those things are great and all together they make a wonderful team. But I think there's not a lot of teams that are completely perfect like that. There's a lot of functional teams. There's a lot of dysfunctional teams. But all we're doing is just labeling them as functional, dysfunctional. What really counts is how it's working and how you're working on moving your team through the step. How do you improve communication? How do you improve working with each other? How do you improve feedback? How do you improve all those things? Because even in a great team, there's still room for growing. And so we get stuck on, hey, you know what? I work in a dysfunctional team. This team will never work. And for me, that's just a training challenge. Dysfunctional is just a label. What does that mean? Well, nobody talks to each other and, you know, we're not going anywhere. Well, for me, now you have described it in observable terms. Now I can start working on, hey, you know what? Let's talk about communication. Let's sit down and let's, you know, you probably see this too when you go to 
a household and the husband in the house gives the bird six pieces of peanut before the, the lady in the house has to work the bird. And he just says, you know what, that's just the way I like to do it. Now, how do we talk about that communication? You probably see it in your communication with your clients as well. When you go to a household and there's a dog that always barks at the door and the husband lets it in every now and then because he's just barking and he wants to come in. How do we improve that? You know, I see it daily. I have great communication in the teams I see, but there's times where I wish there was more. And so those are functional or dysfunctional teams. However you want to label it, there's always room for growth and there's always a way to start moving forward. And if you don't move forward, then you're just moving backwards. So I think it's about, it's a challenge for a manager. It's a challenge for a team to bring that all back together and go, okay, so we think we're dysfunctional, but where is the opportunity for growth? Where can we go from here? I love that. And to quote Tony Robbins, he says, quality questions equal quality life. Let's take away that question there. Where is the opportunity for growth? That's a fantastic question. Hey, thanks so much, Fada. People listening, I hope this has given you some new insight into something which we all know is really important. Next thing I wanted to discuss is this idea of viewing behavior like maths. We've mentioned it a couple of times already. And one word that you used a lot at the conference last year, and we've mentioned a couple of times already in the podcast episode today, is data. We have to collect our data. Now, some people listening might be going, huh, data? What's data got to do with animal training? Can you talk about this concept? Oh, yeah, I am all about data. For me, it's all about seeing what the animal is doing. And that's my data. So when I ask the animal to sit, I put my right hand up and the animal puts its rear end to the ground and then it sits. And then I reinforce the animal, I give it a treat. And so when we talk about data, for me, the data is in what the animal is doing. So when I'm shaping a behavior, is the animal increasing a behavior? Am I reinforcing it? Because by definition, if you reinforce a behavior, that behavior should maintain or increase in a future frequency. So there's my data. If I think that I'm reinforcing this animal for sitting, but he doesn't sit in the future frequency at all, then by definition, the data shows us that the animal is not sitting down. The animal is showing us in the data that this is not really a reinforcer. So let's look at what the animal is doing more than what the animal is thinking or what else is going on. It's really about show me what the animal is doing. And then I can tell you, is it a reinforcer? Is it a punisher? And then when we talk about terminology, I like to talk and I bet you you guys said the same thing. When you talk about positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement, when we think about negative, we always kind of pull towards that part and negative really doesn't mean anything that I don't like or, you know, somebody that I don't like. Negative in science is just like math, minus. It's just subtracting, taking something away. And that's why positive reinforcement, it's not about, oh my gosh, we all love it so much. Positive is just about adding something to the environment that increases or maintains behavior that makes it reinforcement. So there's your math equation. So anytime you talk positive reinforcement, it's just about adding something to the environment. It's not about the emotional state of the animal. And when you talk about negative reinforcement, it's about taking something away out of the environment that has nothing to do with the emotional state of the animal. It's not negatively perceived by the animal to use negative reinforcement because by definition, if it's reinforcement, you're still increasing or maintaining behavior. The behavior is still continuing on and carrying on. So it's really about understanding the science I've had the comment before when I've talked about the maths and the data that it's making training a little bit boring. <laughs> but the, the main crux of it is just understanding the science and taking your time to look at, are we adding something? Are we removing something? Is behavior increasing? Is behavior decreasing? And and collectively, we, we're labeling this as the data. Exactly. And I think I think the data is important to me because when you look, when you look at really good trainers, they are really good observers as data. They really see the small steps, the small approximations toward the end goal, and they see that they're reinforcing it. And after they've seen it X amount of times, two or three times, they know that in the past, their data has shown, if I keep doing this step, three, four, five, six times, I end up at the same spot and it's really hard to move on. So the data that they have collected in the past has shown that. So now they're more experienced. So now they take three repetitions of the same behavior to go, okay, good. They got this step. Let me ask for a little more. Collect the data, see what I get out of that. And then do I relax criteria? Collect the data again. It sounds, I guess to me, it doesn't sound 
boring, but I get where you're getting at. And I think there's no real magic in it. But I think if we all start looking for magic, we just start throwing, like Susan Friedman said, throwing spaghetti on the wall. Let's look at something we all can see and then we can all can grow and we can all make this behavior for this animal much better. It's just confusing to the animal when you start looking at what he's thinking and how we can set it all up and all that good stuff. So I'm all about just looking at what we got going on, just looking at what the animal's given us. And then from there on, I think the animal is looking at us the same way. What are you getting me that I, I can grow on and move on? And they collect data just as much as we do. So for someone sitting out there listening to this podcast who's maybe new to animal training, hasn't been practicing this stuff for a while, and they're thinking, can I use this as a reinforcer? Will this work? Will that work? What we've got to do first is to understand the science understand that behavior quadrant and then if we're attempting to the best of our ability to apply positive reinforcement implement and collect the data is that correct yeah i think that there's a lot of questions in that i think if if you want to use something as a reinforcer that is not up to me you know it's not up to me to go oh you know what i'm going to use use peanut butter for ryan as a reinforcer i'm going to give him a piece of peanut butter every time because how do i know if it's a reinforcer i don't even know if you like peanut butter or not how do i know it's a reinforcer to collect the data look if your behavior is maintained and increasing, then I have a reinforcer. If you keep spitting it out and you don't change your behavior or it's decreasing the behavior I'm trying to reinforce, then by definition, it's a punisher. And so it's your behavior is decreasing or you're using an extinction trial. But if you're trying to add it to it, you got your plus, giving you something, positive reinforcement. So if you're just starting off trying to figure out if I have reinforcers, you know, animals, they, they like things. Dogs like to be pet, like to be a ball being thrown or, you know, we use treats, we use food, whatever you animals like, or people like, you know, we like praise a lot of times with, with people, you can go, hey, good job, that was great, or that was great. And then some people, they don't want to hear it. So it's really up to you to collect the data and see this is what my dog is. So if I want to teach a dog to sit, and then we use a ball, I'm going to ask the dog, I work on a small approximation, the dog brings his hindquarters back, I might go good and throw the ball, dog comes back with the ball, drops it, and I'm going to ask for another step. And if the dog continues going, the data is showing me that throwing of that ball is a real enforcer. If the dog is just staying away with the ball or comes back with the ball and never really does anything else but look at the ball, maybe I need to look at a different reinforcer. Maybe I need to set the, set the situation up. They arrange my antecedents a little bit different to set up that environment. But it's all about, do I have a reinforcer, something that maintains or increases behavior? Do I have the setup right? And, you know, if, if, so is my antecedents set up correctly and then the behavior will come along that, that like susan says there's the cool thing about behavior it doesn't happen in a vacuum behavior is a three-term contingency you got your abcs your antecedents anything that happens before the behavior the behavior itself and the consequence we don't influence behavior at all but the cool thing is we do influence antecedents setting up the environment and consequences what happens right after the behavior and that's 33 or 66.6666667 whatever percent of the equation so we can work on that and then and the behavior kind of comes along with all that. So I'm kind of out of on a tangent to the right, but that's kind of where we want to go. I love it. We have to collect our data. We'll move on, Vada. In this show, we have a large focus on positive reinforcement animal training. Now that I was wondering if we could turn our attention to some of the other parts of the behavioral quadrant and focus on punishment for the next question. Specifically, I wanted to ask if it was okay to share an example you used at the conference of shifting some flamingos in a zoo and how we might view this by reflecting on our own experiences as humans. You know, I think the first thing that's really important to talk about is that when we talk about punishment, we talk about decreasing behavior. It's a procedure of decreasing behavior. The first thing our brains go to, because we're, we're conditioned that way, that punishment is something that is capital punishment. It's something that is going to hurt. I'm really not going to like it, but it can be very, very small. So when you talk about punishment, you know, it goes to people as well. When I think about punishment with people, I think about that bubble invader, you know, bubble invader. I don't know if you guys call that a bubble invader, somebody that takes that step just a little too close to you and you're standing there. And if we look at any behavior, we always start by looking at behavior. So my behavior of standing in proximity to this person gets punished, right? Nothing major because I'm going to step away because you're just a little too close to me, buddy. So the behavior of standing gets punished and it's because of the proximity to that guy. So that's positive punishment. I step away. When I see that guy walk up, my stepping away will increase. So there's a reinforcer. Negative 
reinforcement of the moving away behavior, positive punishment of the standing there behavior. Now, did I die? Did I anything else crazy happen? Because it's punishment, right? In our heads, that's that's something major. It's something really small, but it's just a decrease in behavior over time. So punishment doesn't have to be anything major. So the video I showed in the workshop was a bunch of people just kind of actually two people kind of not pushing up physically, but with their body kind of corralling animals in a certain direction. And that little bit of pressure, pressure as far as just proximity to the flamingo was enough for the flamingo to move away. There was no death defying punishers. There was no sticks, no nothing. It was just stepping a little closer and the flamingo moved away. So when you look at the behavior of standing, that got punished. So there's your positive punisher standing there got punished and moving away got reinforced increase of moving away so you got your negative reinforcer of moving away your positive punisher of the standing behavior there's nothing ma major going on there there's nothing that is going to hurt that animal but anytime we use an aversive i always want to go back to the detriment the side effect of using aversives so there's science has proven that there's at least for detrimental side effects of using an aversive, of you stepping into that flamingo's path and having them move away. That aversive that the animal will move away from um, will get you other things and will get you side effects. So the side effect, one of them is escape avoidance. That's kind of the one that we're working on. You walk closer, but flamingo goes, okay, I got this. I, if you come closer, I move away. Pretty soon you're thinking about moving closer, flamingo sees you and goes, you know what? I'm going to just get away. It's an escape avoidance behavior. Or if they come out of a certain pen, you walking toward the pen gets the animals already going, Going, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll head out. I know what, what is next. Overgeneralized fear of the environment is another one of those. The, the environment is all of a sudden not as comfortable. So as soon as they get outside, they want to get to their pen because they don't want to stay in that area. Apathy. Apathy is another that the flamingo is just going to stay inside. Sit, stand there on one leg, not behaving much. It's just going to just hang out because it's learned that there really isn't anything it wants to do. And aggression. I can imagine that flamingo one day turning around going, hey, buddy, that's enough. And boom, there gets a, gets a nip or a bite. And and when you think about that, like you ask, how do you, how do I see that in, in your day to day life? It's, it's the same thing. It's like your boss talking to you in his office and you get not even reprimanded. A lot of times I'm the same way. I don't like hearing that I didn't do something very 100% great. And so sometimes it's even that moment where they go, Hey, you could have done this a little better. And you go, Oh man, if that's enough of an aversive, you can go through the, that same list of side effects. So you go through escape avoidance pretty soon. You don't want to walk past your boss's office anymore. You just go around another couple of cubicles to, to get there overgeneralized fear pretty soon you go you know what my boss is on the seventh floor i don't really want to go to that seventh floor because he might be there so you got that part of it apathy you know what i i clock in right at eight you know seven seven fifty nine i'm there eight o'clock i'm clocking in at 5.45 or 4.45, I'm standing there waiting to clock out at 5 o'clock. And aggression. Aggression is usually verbal aggression. Aggression, what we see is talking to each other. Oh, you know what? My boss just talked to me. He's such a whatever. And we label that. And that's our verbal aggression that you see just as much. So just like with the animals that you see an aversive, you see that punisher happening. You know, there's there, there is something going on. And we have to just, there's a better way to do it. Instead of using that positive punisher and a negative reinforcer, why not use a positive reinforcer? Why not reinforce? the animal for getting to the other spot. And that is what we look at. Effectiveness is not good enough. We want to make sure that, because that's a problem with punishment. Problem with punishment is that it works. Works beautifully. Decreases behavior and you get what you need. But because it's effective doesn't mean it's good enough. We need to look for our least intrusive, most positive ways of training. And that's why when we're in the operant arena, we look for positive reinforcement training. I love that term, bubble invader vada. <laughs> There's a plethora of Vaterisms to be taken away from the podcast today, everyone. Just wanted to touch on, just before we move to the next question, something you said right at the end of your answer, and that was, we want to move towards the least intrusive, most positive methods with our animals. Can you just quickly touch on that just before we move on and define for everyone listening the less intrusive part of that? And when we're talking about most positive as well, are we talking about adding something to the environment or has that got a different meaning yeah no that's a great catch and i think that is that is where we we run into problem when you talk about most positive is that we're using these words collectively so when we talk about science we think about adding and when we talk about in this instance positive means good to the animal kind of feel and you know susan friedman and c martin are the ones that talk to towards this very well but least intrusive for me is how can i make it part of the animal's idea to do some of these things that I ask them to do? How can I ask them to participate? And how can I set up the environment the most positive way? Like we said with the flamingos, least intrusive for me is not herding them out. It's 
reinforcing him for coming out, taking the smallest approximations to coming out. So that's for me the least intrusive. If I have to get to a cheetah and I have to get a blood draw on that cheetah. I can put a harness on them, I can get a couple guys and I can hold them down and I can get blood. That's fairly intrusive. That's fairly invasive as well. And so how can I make that least intrusive? I can reinforce the animal for coming to a position where I can take blood out of the tail or where I can reinforce that animal for taking those small approximations. So how can I even make that part of him? How can I teach an animal? How can I teach a, a cheetah to back up and give himself an injection that's even le less intrusive than me doing the stick himself we go to we go to long big lengths to make sure that the animal knows exactly what we're doing so when we do our injection behaviors instead of just teaching a jab we always say sticking first because it's shown in scientific processes i saw this with people that if you say sticking before you stick the animal so the animal knows the stick is coming there's less of a physiological physiological see it's my second language too <laughs> physiological response. So they had people hooked up with these two electrodes on their wrist and they would have a screen in front of them and the screen would count down from five to zero and test group one, and they would look at their heart rate and their perspiration and that stuff. Group one, they would look at, they would count down from five to zero and anywhere in the middle, they would get a shot. And so their heart rate went up and their physiological signs were higher than the people that would count down from five to zero and then a stick. Every time five to zero and then a stick, their response was a lot lower. I haven't looked at any data for how that works in animals yet, but I think it helps our cheetahs because it's least intrusive. They know it's coming and we can see them. Sometimes you can see them bracing. You can see them get ready to get the injection, but they'll sit there and get an injection. And they're like, and some of them come right, you know, they stay there and a lot of them will want to do it again. And they're like, okay, there's that resilience. So for me, that's least intrusive. Make it their idea. How can I have them participate? I want them come running in, come and hey, is today an injection day? That's very intru least intrusive. Instead of coming in and getting a dart pole or trying to do that. I think that's really powerful. And thank you so much for sharing that about it. I know a lot of people are going to be potentially thinking about their interactions with their animals and also other humans a little bit differently now moving forward. Sadly, we are nearly at the end. Before we do arrive there though, we have a couple more questions and we're heading into one of my favorite parts of the podcast and this is story time. Valda, could you please share two or three three stories from your experience and some important lessons that you've learned along the way. You know, the story time, it's its my favorite time. There's so many stories we can talk about. When I think about good stories, I think about the teams and, and some of the behavior. You know, I'm a big behavior nut. I love seeing behavior. And one of my highlights is the team's behavior. So I like seeing animals be successful through people and then telling great stories through doing that and reaching an audience, really getting there. So when I think about great behavior in a team, like we just trained this um, ringtail lemur, King Julian. I think there's another 100 other King Julians in the world. But this male uh, ringtail lemur, we had an issue with it. The staff didn't always get a great weight on him because his tail would hang off the scale. And so they got together and they were talking and they go, so how can we do this? We can do antecedent arrangement. So we can set up the environment for success. So we took the scale and put a big perch on it that set high enough for the lemur not to have his tail hanging on the ground. So we got a better weight. But as you know, we travel a lot and they didn't want to carry that perch around. That's a lot more that we have to put in one of these vans. And so we end up going, okay, got it. Why don't we teach him to lift his tail off the scale? And that is when I got super excited about it because the staff figured out that you can train an animal to participate in anything you needed to do. You just got to figure out how to set up your communication and you just got to figure out how to do this. And as a team, they got that prosimian to sit on the scale and then they'll all they'll have to say is go get your tail and they'll turn around and he picks up his tail and holds it like almost like a little umbrella. But those are the moments where I see a team work their way together so well and an animal that gets it, you know, it's not the animal always gets it, but the team and the animal work so well together. And that's a great story. And, you know, the other one I could think of is Petrie. He's a, a craven, a crow raven mix. I don't know why people do that, but we had one. And so he's a smart bird, really, really fast. And he has this really cool behavior of he does a, a nest building behavior. So he goes and he collects rubbish stuff we have found and a couple sticks and a lot of times when we see nest building it's birds just putting sticks in the middle of the nest well if you really look at wild animals or wild birds they take the, the stuff and really put it in the edge of the nest and so they were really picky and they said let's train it the right way so they trained him to pick up the sticks and really place them in the side of the nest and then cans 
and then bags. And so all that stuff went in. And now they do that on programs. So now that animal goes out and shows kids that whatever they find, they put in a nest. And then the team said, hey, we can do better than that, right? So then they taught them to take the cans and the plastic back out of the nest and into a recycling bin. So they'll, the trainer will bring the bin out and all of a sudden he goes, oh, I got this. And he takes all the other stuff back into the bin, which just a team to think of those things and to build, bring it together is great. And to see the people and the animals connect that well is such a high a highlight for me. And I think there's so many of those. There's so many stories like you and I worked at the State Fair of Texas together. And to work at that bird show was amazing. We did so. There's so many stories there. Some of them we shouldn't put on this podcast. And I remember the blue-throated macaws. I don't know if this happened in your year or not, but every every at the end of every show, we had a couple of macaws that looped five, six, seven, depending on what show it was. And these blue throats were big flyers, li- really light birds. So they flew really big and did a really cool job. And one show they left. At the end of the show, they just looped the theater for a while and they were gone. So we ended the show and went started looking for them. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Hour and a half went past and we started setting up for the next show. Just when the next show was supposed to start, somebody goes, oh, I see him. And here's these two birds that came flying back. And just as the next show started, landed in the tree they're supposed to land in. We walked out, gave them their nuts because that's a behavior we like. Might as well reinforce it and picked it up and moved them back to where they were and they were in the next show. And that was never an issue. And I think that those moments where you just let animals be animals and let them just be who they are. And we're not trying to make them do anything. They're participating. They're doing this thing with us. I think if we can always look at it that way, we'll be so much better trainers and so much better at taking care of this planet. Yeah, and the team at Dallas, I said this to Chris when he was on the show, was just amazing. So for everyone listening, I can vouch. Vouda talks the talk and he walks the walk. <laughs> and it wasn't just you there. We had Rob and Stephen and the entire NEI crew was just, for me, a sensational six week in Dallas and definitely amazing team. Now, with that King Julian behavior that you just talked about, I know in Adelaide, you shared a video of that and it was very cool to get a visual of what you just described. Is that possible to share on the podcast right up? Yeah, I'll I'll, uh, I'll get it to you and then we can, we can put it on there, no problem. Fantastic. I think everyone listening to this, to see King Julian on those scales, lifting his own tail up like Vada says as if he was holding an umbrella it's a really cool behavior and really awesome that your team shaped that we are now sadly at the last question and we're going to go full circle here we've learned about where you first started your behavioral odyssey where you currently are i was wondering now though if you could take us into the future and share with us your vision of what you would like to see happen in the air quotes animal training world in the next five to ten years that's such a great question. 10 years down the road, where are we going to be? I think our industry right now is on the brink. We're on such an element where we need to start stepping it up because our audience is used to entertainment all the time. You pick up a phone, you get entertained. You go to Facebook, you get entertained. You turn on the TV, you get entertained. And we have to compete with that. We have to compete with getting people into the zoo and getting them caring about this planet again, caring about animals again. We got to get them close to animals. We got to get people to smell and feel and just be part of it. Like we said a little bit earlier, that nature deficit disorder, I think is really a big issue that we're looking at. And I think that when you think about our motto at the Animal Encounters Village, to touch the heart, to teach the mind, you got to touch the heart, but it's got to come from an animal that's nice and close and something that is comfortable and that shouldn't come at the cost of that animal. So we should be able to get that animal in that position or participating there, least intrusively, most positively. And I think that is where we all need to start looking at how can we set up these environments positively for these animals and positively as in a feely thing, not as a mathematical thing. I think we need to look at what we can do. And then from an animal training standpoint, I think if we can continue to learn from each other, I learn stuff from everybody every day. And I think if we keep looking at most positive ways to train, least intrusive ways to train, carrying on and making sure that we're inclusive. There's so many people out there that have their own ways of training. Oh, this is this person's way and this is that person's way. And I know everybody has their own finesses. But as long as we all can keep an open mind and go, you know what, I learned this from Steve and I learned this from Ryan and Nick taught me this. And when Chris said this, and we make this beautiful melting pot of positive ways of training, that's where we're going. And I think 
that is where this internet is working beautifully, like doing this podcast or being on Facebook. You know, you connect with people much easier. And I think we are going to create such a beautiful wave of positive reinforcement trainers that the world better be ready for it because we need it right now. The world better be ready for it and stepping it up notches. And you guys there at the Columbus Zoo with your African waterhole and the behaviors you've talked about are definitely once again, walking the walk. It's really cool to hear about. And I'm going to steal this Vaderism off you. That Vaderism <laughs> is my new description of the podcast show. The podcast is a melting pot of positive ways of training. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I love it. I Another to, Vouderism. <laughs> I have to thank you for that one. Wonderful vision there, Vouder, and we have our fingers, toes, paws, whiskers, tails, and all other animal parts crossed that this all transpires. That does now bring us to the end of the podcast episode. I hope all of you out there listening enjoyed this as much as we enjoyed making it. And Vouder, from myself and on behalf of the Animal Training Academy audience, a massive thank you for coming on the show today. It's been an absolute blast. Brian, it was a blast for me too. I enjoyed doing it and let me know if you ever need me to do it again. We will potentially take you up on that offer. <laughs> Such inspiring, entertaining and educational information in this episode. And if you guys have enjoyed it, as mentioned, one small thing you could do that would be really appreciated is to share this episode as Vada said as much as you can on social media and any platform that you think it would be beneficial one really easy way to do that and something that I've just discovered this week is that if you are listening to this on your mobile device or smartphones then you can go into the menu of your podcast app and you can do it right from there most apps have three little dots and you can tap on those and there should be an option to share the episode if you click that it's really quick it's really easy and you can share straight to social media from your app and we can make sure that we disseminate this information about best practice animal training and behavior management as far and as wide as possible. That's it from this episode. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening. It is a pleasure to have you with us. And until next time, stay classy and you'll hear from us again soon. Mm -hmm.